Hey everybody, it's the Board Game Blogger. Today I'm here to review Road to Enlightenment. Now this is uh, a game set in sort of the 17th, 18th centuries, uh, with the premise being that it was sort of the great, uh, great personas of the, the time that had the, the big impact on history. And so in it, everyone plays uh, great power, and then you play cards which are sort of the great, as this game describes them, luminaries of the era. So you might have, you know, Isaac Newton or, or someone, and they'll have different values um, and sort of a, an event or a trigger. And now this game was, uh, was Kickstarted, and Kickstarter I think is very hit and miss with uh, quality components. Uh, I think the last Kickstarter review I did for Divided Republic, very, very poor quality components on that game. Um, and I actually traded away Divided Republic for this game. Uh, this game, however, has great components. Um, you've got the, the map, it's fantastic. It's a six fold map, and it lays really nice and flat on the, uh, on the table. It will lay really flat. Um, I really like the six fold. You know, if they don't have the six fold, sometimes you know the board will warp or something. This is really nice. Um, great, great quality map. Um, the card quality is is fairly good. Um, it's uh, it's good. They're easy to handle. You have a uh, sort of wooden wooden chip components for showing when you're denoting taking over cities. Um, the only thing I don't like uh, component-wise are the dice. The dice are too small. Um, the player aids, um, such as they are, sort of where you, it's kind of your tableau where you're playing your cards and you, you're showing the different stacks you use. They're, they're quite nice, um, well done. And uh, the comp quality of the rule book uh, production's good. It's high glossy. Some people don't like it. Um, however, there are issues with, with uh, I think the game that could have had a little bit more design into it. But like the actual production quality, I think is very well done. Um, for the cards, you have different uh, individuals. So here you have, you know, John Bunyan, person who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, and he'll have some different values. Can be used as an anti-Catholic figure. Um, for politics, for military, and then the action, which is kind of his unique event. Um, but all it tells you is that he's John Bunyan, he's an English spiritualist, and the age he lived. And um, I'll get closer up uh, when we show you how you actually play the game. But there's a whole bunch of blank space here that could have put some nice flavor text, you know, a quote by him, someone describing something by him, uh, so you could learn a little bit more about uh, these individuals as you played the game. Um, when this game was going into production, I contacted the designer. I was like, you know, I think you should do this. I think it'd be a great idea. And it was just like, it was going to take too much time to rework all the cards. Um, in his designer notes, um, sometimes people don't put them on the cards, but then they've got some background history. Um, that happens in quite a few games where they won't put the flavor text on the cards. I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, some other people they don't like the flavor text on the cards, but then they want it in, you know, a rule book. That's not even here. He basically says in his designer notes, you can go look them up on Wikipedia. Um, I just don't like that. I like, I'm playing the game, you know, somebody else is kind of thinking about their turn. Um, I want to, you know, read and learn as I play about uh, these individuals. I just, I think that's so much better um, for the whole play experience. Um, he does have some pretty decent designer's notes in here talks about sort of the influences of the game, which are, you know, Here I Stand and Magic the Gathering, and you can really see that when you play the game. Um, the rest of the rule book, however, isn't very well laid out. No uh, table of contents, no index, there's a glossary, um, but the rules just aren't that well written. Uh, it takes a while to, like, you know, have them sink in, I guess, via osmosis from the pages, um, and so it, it takes a while uh, to get in. So those are some issues, I think, with things they could have done better in their production. Um, and 
you know, I really like flavor text. I'm sure if you've watched lots of my reviews, you'll find that's a, a recurring theme. And it just, you know, it could have added so much more flavor and experience to the game. Um, as for the game itself, um, what you'll do is on your turn, you've got sort of two actions you can take any given turn and you play uh, these cards to build up value uh, to do so and we'll get into sort of how the game plays um, but just as it is I think the the turn order can go from 1 to 15 that's that's how many turns you can take in this uh, game and it is uh, a longer game definitely um, and I think from 1 to 15 it's just too long it's just too long and you know first time I played this played it with five players and no one liked it I didn't like it I thought uh, this game you know it's just it's too long it's too kind of time consuming and part of that was for learning the rules um, but for how much depth the game has it goes too long and uh, I've been playing it you know more than uh, and every time since um, we sort of just set a hard turn limit of only do the 9 turns instead of 15. And this way each sort of major census has occurred once. Um, censuses are, are a key thing in this game um, where you progress on your science and art markers. And I think the game's fine with just 9 turns. You know, you don't need it to go this full 15. And if you do, it just drags on too long. There's not that much depth in the game. Um, and I think with the nine turns and you're playing around two, two and a half hours, it's okay. I mean, if you're pushing two and a half hours with this game, you're going to lose interest with it because there's just not that many things to do. Um, additionally, this game can be held up a lot, I think, by having one player who takes a long time to decide what they're doing. It's sort of simultaneous action selection and then... Once everyone's selected their actions, they all play out. And you can definitely have, you know, one player who's just taking so much more time to select their actions, sort of holding up the play. Um, I think that can happen in a lot of games, but this one, sort of more so because of the interactions with the cards. And, I mean, you'd have to play this game a lot, you know, like 30, 40 times to really understand all the, the interaction with all the cards. Um... But I'm sure now you probably want to see how it plays. Um, but I, I think if you cut down the turn length, it, it plays well. It's a unique game. It's not a game I'm going to get to the table every now and then. But it does something kind of neat. It's trying to use these sort of Magic the Gathering. Different cards do different things, trying to get some synergies and combos together. Um, with play on the board, and you can you know take over cities and sort of have combat. The combat's extremely simplified um, and it's just you're playing the cards for different combat values and then you roll the dice each six is a hit um, and you need a certain number of hits. Um, the game gets pretty interesting with the diplomacy though um, because you know England can say ally with Spain and help them send them troops in their battle against France um, but this game does put a big emphasis on uh, not just war, but also sort of a science and art uh, cultural track. There's also a religious track. And moving up on those is very important. Um, that's where the big points are. You don't gain a lot of points from taking over other cities. Um, but you lose a lot from losing your own home countries. So you can't sort of just totally ignore military. But you can't use a military only path. Military can defeat you but it can't really win a game for you and so I think there's an interesting balance there. Um, definitely have had it where some players you know very high up on the art and science track um, you know if they ignore their military doesn't matter that they're leading in those because you know their home home cities are going to be wiped out and they're going to lose uh, a lot of points. But I'm sure you've heard me rambling on enough for now and you want to see how the game actually plays how it looks um, but sort of my final verdict is this game could work for you I think you need to definitely give it a couple of tries the first time I played this I did not like the game um, and it just it went on too long sort of house ruled it down to just nine turns 
and it plays much better that way. Um, but let's see how it actually plays. Okay, so here's the board on setup. Um, we don't have anything occupying anything on the map, but if we zoom in, you can sort of see what's a home country and what's a neutral country. So here we've got uh, Luxembourg, currently owned by Spain. It's part of, you know, Spanish Netherlands. We have uh, the Lorraine, which is owned by France, and we have the Palantade, uh, which is sort of a neutral uh, country. It's not, uh, not the home country for anyone. And you'll see that there's different numbers and colors. So for instance, if we look at Luxembourg, we can see who can actually take over Luxembourg. And it's England for the English color, uh, French for the French color, and then purple for the Austrian color. So red, blue, and purple. Um, and then there's a number of value. And those are the number of hits that need to occur um, to enable the attacker a chance to try and take over the country. So if the hits are more, so let's say it was France attacking Luxembourg and they got four hits uh, during a battle, then they take it over. If they got an actual equal number, if they got three, then it's going to go to a negotiation. And, you know, France could kind of negotiate with the citizens of Luxembourg for its surrender. And if they got less, if they only got, say, one or two hits or zero hits, then during the attack it would remain uh, in Spanish hands. And if we look over here, we've got the side of the board, we've got the different types of cards. There's military, politics, science, art, Catholic, and anti-Catholic. Now when the game starts, you're going to have your three uh, luminaries. So here on my sort of player aid here, I've got my three luminaries picked out. Now you're either a Catholic or you're an anti-Catholic power. And you'll then get, depending on what you are, a Catholic or an anti-Catholic uh, sort of favorite. Now favorites are unique and they're denoted by this sort of star in the upper left hand side and you get access to them every game turn so you can use them and they'll go right back into your hand right here so you always have access to your your three favorites um, things can happen to them they can get assassinated uh, and then you will lose access to them but generally you'll have them uh, throughout the entire game and access to them every turn so your religious one is distributed just sort of randomly, whereas uh, you have one from either politics or military and one from either art or science, and those are drafted. Um, and, you know, sort of like a, you know, a magic gathering draft where first player looks at them of the number. You're going to have access to one more than the number of players playing. Um, so here in this game, sort of a sample three-player game, We'd have four. Uh, first player looks at it and then passes it on to the uh, left. Um, and vice versa for, for the art and the science. So you got the military and the politics and the art and science and sort of they're going around in opposite directions. One starts with France, one starts with the person to the right of France, and it's a pretty even uh, thing. So while you may have first pick of the politics and the military, you're going to have the last pick of the science of the art, or you'll be in the middle pick for both. Uh, I think it's probably a fair distribution. And that's how you get your three sort of uh, favorite luminaries. Then you're also going to pick ten more from here, and taking turns, uh, starting with France is you're going to draft one and they're going to be face down so you won't actually know what you're doing whereas the the uh, favorite draft you're looking at the cards so you're knowing what you're getting and you announce oh I want you know a science and then it it moves on so after France drafts, drafts one then England uh, chooses one so you know France says oh I want a science England says I want a military Spain says I want an art and it goes back to France and you're going to pick 
10 additional luminaries, 10 additional cards. Um, and so you can see during setup, this is pretty important because you can see if someone is taking a lot of military or if they're taking a lot of science and sort of what they're focusing on. If you notice that someone's not getting a lot of military, then you can, you know, prepare to attack them later on. Now there are ways to, to get more of these into your hand that's important is drawing more figures, more luminaries. Um, but the, the setup's very important, very important in the, the initial game. So you're going to have 10 additional luminaries to your favorite and then you will draw a hand of 7. So you have access to your 3 favorites and your hand uh, of 7. And now you, you'll, you'll pick an uh, action. You're going to have 2 actions a turn except when there's going to be a special census which I'll get into. Censuses are very important in the game and you're going to start with some basic actions. Everyone will have their own sort of player aid um, which just quickly runs down the turn sequence so you do everyone simultaneously doing an action selection then you'll do action resolution by turn order then you'll do your accounting um, you don't have to pay for your upkeep and then you'll refresh. On the other side explain sort of how an, an attack negotiation occurs and the determination of die rolls. So there's three basic actions. Um, you have the reorganization. That lets you draw two luminaries. So you can draw two uh, of any kind you want as long as there's some remaining to be chosen. And you can also uh, discard you know, bad ones and remove them from the game. So it's kind of, kind of like a, a deck builder in that sense, in that you're drawing good luminaries and you're trashing them. So you can al you always have access to this. You can attack. That is, you can invade somebody else's territory. Allies can contribute to either side. And then you can exhaust... Um, if you're not yet at war, you need to exhaust five politics to declare war on someone. And then there's diplomacy, which is allying with another major power. You have to be allied in order to military support them and to give them money. Um, and that costs five politics as well. Um, there's also going to be other cards here that have unique actions. So here, um, this guy, Francisco Boromi, he will let you advance one on Catholic and on the science marker. You then remove him from the game. And then for each artist or craftsman you also exhaust, you can receive three money. So he's kind of a unique one-time use individual, or you can use him uh, for his values here. And this is important in other aspects, in a census or in some other uh, unique things. So this guy, Jan Voss, also has an action. And actions can also then have enhancements played on them. Um, so, for instance, here with uh, Johan De Witt, his enhancement is he's not exhausted when used to complete a diplomacy action. So, normally, as we saw with the diplomacy, you have to exhaust someone that has five, a total of five politics. So here, Johan De Witt has five politics. So I could put him down with the action while I'm planning my action. So here there's spots for the different action spaces and I'd put it down here for the action. When it came to my turn I would reveal I'm doing a diplomacy and then I also have to pay then the five politics which could be paid by him um, but however he's not exhausted when used uh, to enhance this action. So I would get him back in the hand um, be able to play him for another type of event, maybe exhaust him for something else, uh, use him sort of in military defense or in taxes and trade, that type of thing. So now I will be planning uh, various actions and I only get two and then I also have to do taxes and trade. Now each major power is going to have a different 
upkeep value and a treasury limit. So here, Spain starts the game with their full treasury limit. Most powers will only start with half your treasury limit. But also have an upkeep of seven, which you have to pay each turn. That's going to vary depending on the power. Each enemy city that you conquer is going to add one to that upkeep. So it can be very expensive to maintain this kind of uh, sprawling empire. And you're going to have to devote individuals to your taxes and trade section. Now, when you're doing that and devoting uh, people for taxes and trade, you get a dollar for each one of both politics and wealth. So, for instance, this guy here, Captain Kidd, he has one politics and one wealth. So he'd get a dollar. Um, Rembrandt here has one politics, I mean one wealth. So I could put Rembrandt with Johann de Witt. Now he has five politics and combined they have three wealth. So I could put them both down for the taxes and trade and then they would net three wealth. So why don't I just plan out my, my actions now and then we'll resolve them one by one. Okay, so we've got the action selection. Now we do uh, resolution, France goes, then England, and then I as Spain will do my first um, action resolution. So we flip over what I've put down and I'm doing the attack. Um, now this I'm just sort of doing just for gameplay demonstration. I really, as you saw in my hand, I didn't have enough military in my hand. Um, this attack is basically going to fail, but uh, I just want to explain sort of how it works. So I need to, I'm going to invade somebody else's territory, and I need to exhaust five additional politics if I'm not already at war with someone. So I'm going to exhaust from my hand, so we will discard, put him into the exhaust pile, he has five politics, and I'm now at war. We'll declare war on France. So, whoops. We will go up here to the diplomacy track, and now. France and Spain are at war. And I announced sort of where I'm attacking. So we'll attack in from um, Aragon to Gascony. Now I have a default strength uh, for land of eight, while France's default strength is not. Um, I will then, you know, reveal sort of um, who's in my stack here and I have three additional military symbols. So I'll add three to my eight. So I'm at 11 to France's nine. France can then choose to put in a stack um, of cards from their hand. They have to be remaining from their hand. Um, in my hand, I just have these two. So I've already seen sort of who Fr what France has done. They've exhausted some military in attacking a neutral, uh, which failed. So I felt kind of confident in making the attack. So we now have 11 minus 9 gives me 2, so I have 2 dice to roll. Um, I need to hit on both to take get a chance even of taking Gascony. If they're both hits, then it goes into a negotiation. Um, additionally, I could have spent some money to give myself um, a better advantage. So for every dollar I spend, that's an additional die roll. Um, so. I would announce how much money I'm spending, reveal my cards, the defender then announces how much money they're spending in their stack, then anyone who's allied to France can throw in some cards from their hand, so it's always good to keep some military cards back in your hand if you're not doing a, a declaration of war or an attack that term to sort of defend, 
Once that occurs, we then roll the dice. So I roll the two dice. I need sixes to hit. No, fail. Um, you only hit on six. You really need to be bringing a lot uh, to bear when you're doing an attack. This was, there was no way it was going to occur. Um, if I was going in mass, I would want to use a lot of military, spend a lot of money. So that attack failed. These cards then move over. Um, we now go around and we now reveal my second action. And here I'm playing Boromini. I advance one on the Catholic. So Catholic becomes a little more powerful. Now, if you're belonging to at the end of the game, either the Catholic or the anti-Catholic side, whichever side this marker's on, and there are some lines, it's kind of tough to see from far away. But if you look really close up, there are some lines that denotes. Then you'll get an additional two points. Um, so sort of the Catholic players want to act in unison. The anti-Catholic players want to act in unison as well. So, we'll play Baromni. So we've moved that up one. We also move up one on the science track. So we'll move one here, and that will knock France out. Um, if you're moving in to create a tie, the person moving in knocks the other person back. So France is no longer on the science track. And being high up on these tracks are very important, because at the end of the game, whoever is highest on a track that is leading gets three points on both the science and the art tracks. Uh, second place is one point. You get one for each place you've conquered, negative two for each one you don't have, two points for where on the spectrum Catholic and anti-Catholic are, and one point for each medal you've collected. So the first person to reach here gets this medal, and it, it cannot be derived. You know, de they can't be deprived of it. It's permanently with them. Um, whereas, you know, leading in science, you could be the first one to get here, but then, you know, your science uh, progress stagnates, and other people can shoot ahead. So being first in time is, is important as well as to just overall leadership. So we've played him for the action, and now for each artist or craftsman I exhaust, I can also receive three. So I'll also exhaust these two guys from my hand. They're both artists, if we look, and they're both artists, and so you can see there's a very Magic the Gathering influence there. So these cards are put in the exhausted pile. He is removed from the game. It says remove, can't be used again, and then I will collect six bucks. So you can see there's, uh, you know, Depending on their occupation, they can be used in different synergies. Uh, very heavy uh, sort of MTG influence here. And then finally, we have taxes and trade. So we check here. We add up the potential amount we can earn. So we threw in nine value worth of politics. And wealth is four, six, seven, ten. But we only have nine of politics, so we can still only get nine. And the lower number is the constraint. So then we would earn nine dollars. However, I didn't spend any money this turn. And I'm already at my treasury limit, and I have to discard down to 20. So all that money I made goes away. So it would have been much more effective to have used that for eat for an extra dice, you know. I could have spent, especially if I had done this action first that earned me additional six money and then spent, you know, twenty-two dollars to try to do this attack on France, probably would have been successful then, even though I didn't have a strong military. It's like I'm hiring mercenaries. And then we'd advance the turn marker one. And that's sort of just how how you play the basic game. Um, everyone's doing simultaneous actions. You're going to have a lot of negotiation. And then you're also going to have these unique uh, censuses. So we don't know when a census is occurring. So here, for instance, there is no census. Here, no census. Here, no census. Wow, really unlucky. 
Um, the next one, on the seventh turn, when we get there, we flip it over and see what's occurring, and it's going to be the science census. So instead of a sec second action, uh, you can devote people to the census. And here it's going to be both your science and uh, your sort of ideas value. So here he's worth three, and people put them down into the census. Um, you're going to then see who is winning the most at the end. You know, calculate it. Oh, I've got 14 points. France has 12. And then move up the uh, census tracks accordingly. Uh, that is, uh, the person who wins moves up four on the science track. The person who's second moves up two. Third place gets you nothing. And that's sort of how the game works. If, for instance, I'd won that battle um, for Gascony, I would put that there. I'd have to pay an additional upkeep. Um, I only had to pay seven upkeep this turn. So again, I end the turn with my max of 20 because I'd earned more than seven. Um, that's the game. So that's uh, the game. Uh, I'm not sure how balanced some of these cards are. Some of the cards can be really powerful, you know, advance you in the art and you don't have to remove them. Some it's, you know, one time use and they're weak cards. And so there's definitely, the cards themselves are not very balanced and you can luck out with sort of what card you just draw. However, um, the game sort of self balances or should uh, because of diplomacy and the player interaction and if you're way in the lead, you're going to have people gang up on you. Um, or at least that's the only effective way to stop someone who's way in the head in the science and art tracks. And so I, I think the game is balanced if the players do the balancing. Though there are some cards that, you know, quite powerful. Um, and that's, that's sort of the game. As you've seen, like, just doing the two actions a turn in the census of in trade, uh, there's not a lot that's happening. You're trying to find synergies where you use an action card and then have a proper enhancement onto it. And there's also cards that are response cards that you can play in reaction to other players. So here, uh, this was uh, my favorite. So during an attack action that I'm not part of after the stacks are created, but before they're revealed, I can choose one participant to lose a total value equal to the money I currently hold. So something where I'm not a part of it um, can really hurt someone um, who's put a lot of money into a battle. Um, and so there's, there's definitely sort of response cards, just like the interrupt cards. And it's, it's an interesting game. You've got the censuses that bump things up, but it goes too long with 15 turns. There's just not enough to it. It doesn't have the type of depth that Here I Stand does. What you can see Here I Stand has a, you know, a direct uh, connection to this. Um, the designer talks about it in his designer notes, but it's, it's too, too light of a game to have a kind of a here I stand time frame. And the 15 turns, it's, it's too long. I don't like the fact that there's no flavor text on the cards. And the designer just simply says, go check Wikipedia. Um, it adds so much to the game and the ambiance, I think, when you've got the flavor text on the cards. Um, in conclusion, I think it's a decent game. Um, and it, it, it's not a game for everyone, um, but I like it. It, it. There's enough to it, and if as sort of house rule in the turns, it's enjoyable. Um, it's not a type of game you're going to play every time, but the components are great. Um, artwork and everything looks looks really nice. Um, and this may be a game for you. It's not for everyone. There's definitely going to be a lot of conflict. You're definitely going to get attacked. Um, probably going to get backstabbed at some point. Um, the dice can control your fate in some battles. You obviously mitigate that based on the type of cards you put in and the number of dice you're going to roll. Um, but you can still get unlucky. Um, 
If you don't like luck, you're not going to like this game. I mean, luck happens in a lot here, and it's all about mitigating the luck, uh, which I enjoy. So I like this game. I think it's a good Kickstarter game. Uh, looking forward to other games put up by this designer. Um, and you can see he's already improving them. Uh, his new game, I think, is the New Science. You can see, I could see sort of the, the tableaus that they were using um, done up. The game's not out yet. Um, but instead of, you know, here is sort of England's tableau currently with some unique special powers and a negative for everyone. But in the new science, they've got a whole sort of write-up about the person. So I think that flavor text complaint I have here um, is being addressed in his new game. Um, and I, I would just say um, probably a, a try before you buy almost. Unless no one in your gaming group has this, then I would say go out, get it. It's worth trying. Um, anyway, till next time on the Board Game Blogger.